Hello and welcome to this conversation between me and uh, Gayatri, who is an MA student at IIT Madras. We're going to talk about uh, Ruskin Bonds, the Blue Umbrella. Um, the text that I'm using is the one which has been illustrated by Archana Srinivasan. It's a wonderful book and the illustrations are lovely to look at. So I would recommend this edition for um, this particular course. Hi Gayatri, how do you find the book? The book it's really uh it's kind of it it's a children's book mm -hmm. as they had said but i think it's very relevant for any age group yeah i i am a teenager mm -hmm. and i've read it and i can take as much as i can out of this yeah so can the children i think yes. it, the children too will understand there's a variety a spectrum of emotions being mm. displayed from jealousy to uh Greed. generosity mm. to greed to forgiveness yes and i think people of any age group will have yes. something to take away from this book definitely. absolutely absolutely yeah that, that's quite right i mean um even a two-year-old or who's beginning to uh trying to, to understand stories right even that kid can uh, uh understand some of the emotions that's running through the book and especially the blue umbrella which is a very very attractive object the color blue uh is also a very interesting choice um to adopt in this particular uh story so it is quite appealing both to the adults and to the children because morals are the same regardless of the age the morals don't change right so uh that's why i think it's perennially appealing across the ages i think that's one of ruskin bond's genius mm -hmm. yes. yes uh so moving on to the story the characteristic that is extremely striking from the book is the personification of nature mm -hmm. how close we feel with the nature the reader feels as if that person is in that forest mm -hmm. that person is running through the hills and yes. it's beautiful so what do you think yeah it the, the the descriptions of nature have been very skillfully done it's a it's a masterly rendering of the minute aspects of nature and as you say, we do feel as if we are there with Binya running down the hill slopes, you know, trying to, uh, you know, be careful where we place our footsteps so that we don't get, uh, you know, um, struck by these pine needles. So all these aspects are there. And we also almost imagine as if Biju has been, you know, um, stung by all these bees. Um, so that uh, is because of the power of uh, Ruskin Bond's pen. And he has experienced all these hilly regions firsthand and he communicates it very very um, easily and simply it's almost as if it's effortlessly it's done it's very fluid yes and and the sentence structures are very simple and the choice of words are not too complicated and that makes it charming as like once again across the That's ages easy. to everyone and but but uh, as i mentioned in some of my uh, lectures uh, nature is not um, as simple or as charming as we think it to be in in ruskin born there are uh dangerous aspects of nature uh, right from you know heavy rain to winter storms when binya was born uh, to leopards prowling um in the hills in fact if you look closely at the concluding stages of the novel she's careful not to um you know come into uh, contact with a leopard she's she's hurriedly going home that's there but somehow we tend not to notice all those things because we are kind of charmed uh, by the delightful language the happy uh, aspects of life the simple aspects of life but uh, nature can be really terrible uh, the bear which visits rambras and leaves behind a claw um, it can be threatening but it also is kind of slightly generous which makes Ran Barosa kind of give a claw pendant to uh, Binya and then we have the leeches and at what point he says that it's a beautiful season except for the leeches and so uh, they do live in close communion with nature they do enjoy the aspects of nature and especially we are uh, supposed to look through the eyes of Binya we kind of tend to follow her so uh, her admiration of nature kind of uh, is passed on to us uh, in some respects so she's the kind of the ideal girl at the heart of the book but the funny thing is we don't get to know quite a bit about her thought process um, so that's very interesting too so the the very uh, simplistic attitude to nature is retained on the yes. part of the readers 
again the tourists they come only when the grass is all green again yeah. when it starts raining there are no tourists and the natives are left all alone yes yes so. true that they they come when it's ideal for them to visit right the summer season when when um, you know the nature is at its prime that's when they come for a picnic and of course they don't see the harsher side of nature during the winter or during the monsoon seasons isn't yes. it and the monsoon season brings out the snakes as well which is um uh, you know uh, at yeah. one time been um you had an encounter yeah. right with the with a poisonous snake it's a very close shave for her and she's really terrified isn't it so we do have these uh, disturbing elements of nature the really scary elements are there but it's, well, it's yeah it's slightly yeah. hidden uh, what do you think is the narrative conflict in yeah. this story <clears throat> there are uh, a couple of uh, conflicts and we have the big conflict where uh, rajaram is employed by ramburos to steal the uh, umbrella but um, that conflict is the most important and it's a high point of the story but there are like mini conflicts uh, which are uh, kind of a run up to the big one so we have the mini conflict where the wind mm-hmm. plays the wicked role it steals the umbrella and throws it down a cliff side and binia has to scramble down a cliff face and it's a precarious is descent again yes. if she if she slips and falls it's a descent uh, 80 meters down uh, by the side of a stream right which is strewn with a uh, big boulders um so uh, um if she falls it would be it would mean death for her so that is one uh, conflict and again the source of the conflict is nature and the other conflict um as i uh, mentioned in my lecture videos is the conflict with the snake mm. and here um the umbrella becomes a shield it's it's like a weapon uh, which protects her so there the umbrella is almost like a lucky charm just as a leopard's claw mm. is supposed to function right and then finally we have the big conflict with um uh, ramburosa and raja ram there's even a fight scene sequence bollywood uh, fashion you know a big sequence where these two boys fight really um you know hardly and uh, biju is the winner and he rescues the umbrella and gives it back to his uh, sister so that's the major conflict there could you talk about the internal conflict within ramburosa mm, yes and... yes that's the the symbolic the metaphorical the figurative mm. conflict that's running through and uh it's very interesting that uh you know uh when he wants to uh, get the umbrella there's no conflict that he wants to get it he's rich he can afford it uh, he's the richer, uh, richest man in the region he says right so it seems almost as if it's its right to own exactly. the umbrella it's his prerogative right but then the the conflict that you're talking about uh, that psychological conflict is a very uh, interesting point that happens later during the resolution of the narrative interestingly when um, binya deliberately leaves the umbrella behind and he kind of seizes the umbrella opens it inside his t-shirt and then he enjoys that moment it's a it's a bizarre moment it's a surreal moment and um suddenly he realizes that's the eureka moment for him what am i going to do with this umbrella i'm hardly outside rajaram points this out when mm. he asks mm. ramburosa why mm. does he need the umbrella mm. for exactly. he says it's just a thing of beauty yes. and i need it for myself mm. Mm. and he's a very very clever man this ramburosa he says that it's it's the thing itself and he says um you know almost um in 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 shylock style i have a human soul and therefore i should own this thing of beauty that rhetoric reminded me of uh, shylock's merchant of venice so he argues really very cleverly in order to somehow um you know uh, very cleverly push raja ram to think about uh, getting the umbrella for a price so he's very manipulative as well it's very subtly done so you cannot put it past him hmm. so he almost was very cleverly places the idea in rajaram's mind and rajaram being an employee is somehow duty bound but then he exploits the situation for his um, you know benefit too so the psychological conflict is a very good point something uh, we need to think about and that is clear when when he touches the umbrella mm-hmm. owns the umbrella it's almost as if the umbrella kind of changes his mind and he uh, goes back to binya to give it back to her uh there's one more thing which is very interesting um age death relationship relationships these are all very heavy topics mm-hmm, i feel mm-hmm. and these are just dealt with very off handedly by raskin mm-hmm, boy mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. true true um it's it's kind of marginalized somehow it's just a paragraph in the beginning mm-hmm. and then everything the description of nature is so big mm-hmm. is so huge again you just talk about mm-hmm. his father their father's death and he says 
it didn't make any difference yes, to yes absolutely um absolutely and that's why um the narrator is a little bit uh um interesting that way the third person narrator who does the storytelling uh we need to kind of think about his motivations in in the way he narrates the story why has he suppressed all these heavy topics all these you know big issues and i'm sure the absence of a father would have been felt by um this young small family but that's kind of suppressed and um father that the idea of father is very interesting because ram burrows at one point says that i'm glad that rajaram is not my son oh. i don't have to play the father to him i don't have to discipline him uh, because only if your father you're supposed to worry about the moral compass of your kid so that that idea of fathers and um, sons and and the death of fathers it's very very interesting and and that uh, dysfunctionality of of a home you know the um, it, the, the uh, a full home which is not complete in the sense that one parent is missing uh, we don't get to know about raja ram's family we don't get to know about ram burrows's family we don't get to hear a lot about binia's mother she's kind yes. of an absent figure Good. too so families we just get glimpses of them and and we don't know what's going on at home uh, again the motive behind him writing about father's death mm-hmm. uh, i i don't know if i'm extrapolating it but still um his father mm-hmm. his own father yeah. he died when he was 8 or 10 mm-hmm, years mm-hmm, old mm-hmm. of malaria yeah. or something uh, do you think there's an autobiographical element to this yes, the motive possibly. is autobiographical yeah possibly uh, the missing father uh, is as a kind of a presence um so uh, even the mother is is hardly present in this particular uh, narrative so the absent parental figure uh, in raskin bond's own life could have played a part somehow or the other in the way he structures um you know the characters of these young children who are almost always on their own they are, they are kind of lonely figures who who kind of navigate the problems of life on their own in in some ways like binia and biju right yes. so um they they kind of um, take on a lot on their young shoulders in some respect so that could be there um it it could be one of the factors uh there are different kinds of categories described by bond in the story mm-hmm. there's the natives mm-hmm. then there are the tourists there are the adults there are, there are the children mm-hmm. so how do you look at these categories uh, do you find any similarities or differences among these mm, mm. let's first talk about the adults and the children in mm, the story mm. yeah let's look at the um, uh, tourists in this regard uh, uh we have um, the picnickers right from the plains and um binya at uh, one point she uh, hides behind the curtain of the trees and looks at all the stuff that's uh, displayed she admires their clothes listening to their unfamiliar accents and gazing rather hungrily at the sight of all their food and then her gaze came to rest on a bright blue umbrella a frilly thing for women which lay open on the grass beside its owner and then she kind of quietly comes out and then they notice the older of the two women notices um benya and she says a little village girl isn't she pretty remarked the other but how torn and dirty her clothes are it did not seem to bother them that benya could hear and understand everything they said about her they are very poor in the hills said one of them then let's give her something to eat and the older woman beckoned to binia to come closer hesitantly nervously binia approached the group normally she would have turned and fled but the attraction was the pretty blue umbrella it had cast a spell over her drawing her forward almost against her will so um the attitude of the picnickers from the plains is very clear they see the village girl as pretty attractive but then um uh, the poverty becomes very apparent to them uh they notice all the clothes and they talk as if binya is not present there so that um self-centered egoistic attitude of the picnickers is contrasted with binya's own attitude uh, which she can be persistent she can be stubborn um in her own way uh but then towards the end of the story we can see her change in attitude too you know um so uh there are parallels 
in terms of the construction of the ego between the adults and the children that is there we cannot see the children as purely pure innocent mm. you know devoid of any kind of discrimination uh, in terms of the attitude towards the other uh, the children are mini adults that's how i read um, this particular text and they carry the same kind of uh, you know um, gender uh, stereotypes or class stereotypes or race stereotypes to a certain extent and these can be apparent in children's narratives too uh, but um, in the case of adults it becomes really very noticeable in the children it becomes a less noticeable perhaps that could be uh, the reason why we tend to see children as more a continuation of the extract mm-hmm. here the older woman calls her to give her food food yeah but then that food is again he, she never gets the food she mm-hmm. sees the umbrella and then she yeah. gets the tiger claw and the poverty just disappears yes, there yes she so, gazes hungrily that's a very yes. interesting thing too so we also need to think about the economic status of this particular family which has a small patch of land on the uh, hillside and they and they kind of sell milk to the temple pujari to mm-hmm. the uh, schoolmaster they they make ends meet and through hard work and if you notice towards the end of the story binny is picking up porcupine quills from the uh, from grass floor right of the hills so it's hard labor and she gets paid very very little and that payment is done by raja i mean rambarosa which is again very interesting when the theft of the umbrella happens this poor kid is picking up stuff so that she can give it to this old man this kinflint right so we need to uh, put everything in context it's like a puzzle that we need to bring to together um and the uh, attitudes of the adults and children yeah you said yeah the one and the one thing that's very interesting is that the only adult we get to see quite a bit is rambarosa and he is a very very what to say not a very admirable representation of an adult figure right yes but there's an extract by bond here mm-hmm. which says uh, how uh, adults and children react to the blue mm-hmm. umbrella mm-hmm. how they say um uh, Can we read it? Yeah, right? yeah, please. I have this here, page 29 in my edition. Um most people consoled uh themselves by saying that Binya's pretty umbrella wouldn't keep up the rain if it rained heavily, that it would shrivel in the sun if the sun was fierce, that it would collapse in a wind if the wind was strong, that it would attract lightning if lightning fell near it. and that it would prove unlucky if there is any ill luck going about secretly everyone admired it so um i am reminded of the sour ga- grapes philosophy when i yes. read these a very rhetorical set of ideas if anything bad was going to happen um the umbrella would kind of attract that evil thing that's around it so um that's the attitude of the adults because they can't get hold of it and if you remember the school master's wife wants to have this umbrella yes. because she has um, you know studied up to ba degree and the temple pujari he wants a multicolored umbrella so that he can um, you know uh, have a superior one than binias so he goes to town to get a multicolored umbrella but he is uh, disappointed that he can't get it um, so uh, they kind of have this idea that uh, since they're superior they should have this thing and the same philosophy is applied by uh, rambarosa too because he has wealth as his talisman so he has that quite a bit so which means this beautiful thing must be his property um th- that kind of philosophy doesn't apply to the children yes. right so that's where we have a subtle difference between the adults and the children and the children what do they do they were full of praise for the umbrella It was so light, so pretty, so bright a blue. It's almost as if the narrator is channeling the thoughts of the little kid, so admiring this blue umbrella. And it was just the right size for Binya. They knew that if they said nice things about the umbrella, Binya would smile and give it to them to hold uh, for a little while, just a very little while. So even that slight bit of manipulation is at work in the minds of the children too, but uh, it's for a positive reason, yes. so that they can get what they want uh, from Binya. So um, you're you're quite right. I mean, uh, there is a difference between adults and children in certain areas, but uh, in some areas they mimic the adults to get what they want. so that's kind of that seeds are sown by the adults um and and that's the tragedy somehow uh again the choice of the name mm-hmm. ram barosa mm-hmm. barosa meaning trustworthy, trustworthy. in hindi mm-hmm. uh it's very interesting mm-hmm. so uh, could you talk about his character and his relation the relationships he shares with 
other people mm, mm, in the mm, story mm. especially with raja ram his employee yeah so um it's a very ironic name uh, my question back to you would be was he ever trustworthy in the first place uh, because if we um see these children and how they are trapped by ramborosa into getting all these sweets and toffee for credit and ultimately they're not able to pay him back and look at what he does he gets back all their prized possessions yeah. they could be a pair of earrings some knife a very intricate knife and also some stuff from the little kids some of which he kind of hangs on to and some of which he sells them on so um he he likes to make a profit out of these really innocent young children and at the same time he wants to kind of magpie like collect all the mm. beautiful stuff and hang on to it so it's a, um, a very very less admirable quality that he has and um his nature is put uh, spelled uh, it out you know uh, who does it uh, rajaram does it at the end of the story he says he's a skin flint yes right that's the uh, first time that we kind of get a description for his character even though everybody understands that that's what he does right so um ram barossa it was never trustworthy in my reading of the book and uh, people mock him um uh, very directly at the end of the tale because they get the chance to do it the mm. opportunity to do it through binya's umbrella so he's kind of exposed that way and the umbrella becomes a, a kind of a, a, a charm to expose the faults and follies and foibles of these uh, men um on the on the hilly village So um did I answer your question a relationship between Raja Ram and Ram. Yeah Raja Ram and Ram Barossa and again as I mentioned in my uh, lecture videos these two characters seem to be mirror images of one another even yes. the names are almost similar and I sometimes mix up between Ram Barossa and Raja Ram because they're um as I said uh, they sound the same and um Raja Ram understands the workings of Ram Barossa right he he kind of knows what ram barossa wants and he kind of provides the solution and it's also very interesting to see how ram barossa depends on ram uh, raja ram right um, you know if you steal the umbrella and give it to me everybody will know what i'm supposed to do then i mean it's it's very funny to see this old guy kind of try to get all the solutions from this poor child this little boy school poing boy and he says i don't care what you do i mean you can go to the town get a dye uh, do whatever you want but then i can just get it to, to you for a uh, particular, uh, particular amount of money so um it's it's a uh, there's a lot of dependency on these two right and once he sacks um raja ram he becomes very very lonely because he has no company mm. and everybody ostracizes him so um i would see them as kind of um you know parallels uh, in some way in terms of the moral attitudes as he was a uh, children mimic adults mm-hmm. and raja ram is in the transient stage yes. of he's in he's an adolescent as mm-hmm. far as he goes to school like biju he's uh, he's a ca- classmate of biju but they're never friends and um it's uh, and and he tries to get hold of biju to work for him and he refuses and it's very interesting to see how binya and biju stay away from this old man they never get things on credit and like the other innocent children so these two kids are smarter yes. than the rest uh, in the way they relate, relate to this particular old guy uh Let's talk about how uh, Binya gives the mm-hmm. umbrella to Raja Ram. Mm-hmm. How she feels sad and how she feels responsible yes. for Ra- Ram Barossa's uh, mm-hmm. plight. So, do you think she's playing a stereotype mm-hmm. by doing mm-hmm. this? Do you mm-hmm. think because she's a girl, she had to feel this way? She felt responsible. She felt mm-hmm. how he. all that yeah you think you, she's playing a stereotype yeah it's a very very good question let's look at the particular extract because uh that guilt factor needs to be um uh, highlighted and we can see the difference in attitudes between uh biju and binya in terms of uh ram barossa's um fault okay uh it's in page 49 in my book um binya says uh, the narrator says she kept reasoning with herself telling herself that the umbrella was her very own and that she couldn't help it if others were jealous of it but had she loved the umbrella too much had it mattered more to her than people mattered she couldn't help feeling that in a small way she was the cause of the sad look on ramboros's face and the ruinous condition of his shop bijo says his face is a yard long mm. okay that's that's his comment 
It was all due to his own greed, no doubt, but she didn't want him to feel too bad about what he had done because it made her feel bad about herself. And so she closed the umbrella whenever she came near the shop, opening it again only when she was out of uh, sight. So she does feel responsible for this change uh, in situation for Ram Barossa. And if you look at Ram Barossa's thought about it, he says he wished he had never set eyes on it. Because of the umbrella, he had suffered the tortures of greed, the despair of loneliness. It's, it's a bit exaggerated in terms of his uh, choice of words there. Because of the umbrella, people had stopped coming to his shop. So he's trying to shift the blame onto, onto the, the umbrella. But then the reality is that the umbrella does cause a lot of issues in the uh, village um, and this material commodity which has come from the plains from the town does play havoc in the minds of all these people and um, the, the, the sad thing here is that as, as you mentioned uh, just because she's a girl and, and uh, she somehow um, she somehow feels as if she is responsible and she has to do something to sort the issue right uh, and, and it, that burden is put on her shoulders and um so what she does is she tries to uh, give the old man the umbrella in a very very subtle manner but at the end of the day um you know just as the other people had wanted this umbrella is no longer the property of the little yes. girl right this poor cultivator's daughters can't have this umbrella that's what they thought from the schoolmaster's wife to Rambarosa to the temple pujari none of them uh, wanted binya to have this beautiful thing because uh, it doesn't fit her station in life uh, a poor cultivator's daughter can't have this beautiful frilly thing which is meant for ladies to play with right mm. it's not a very productive thing and so what is a non-productive aesthetic object doing in the hands of this um girl from the village right so um the ending is a bit complex and problematic but we have this idealized moralistic huh. formula of you know of this girl is very forgiving she gives back the umbrella and the umbrella ultimately becomes the property of the entire village that's a very very um, sleight of hand i would say of ruskin bond because he doesn't let the umbrella be with the old man he makes the entire village share in its beauty somehow and somehow that makes it all right to take this thing away from the little girl so so um, I don't want to talk more because I'll break the hands of our uh, hearts of all these people who adore this, exactly. uh, n- um, you know, novella, so to speak. Including mine. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I find the choice of the umbrella as the protagonist of the story very interesting. It's it's an object which everybody takes for granted. Mm. Nobody gives a second thought about it. Mm-hmm. So why do you think why this choice mm. of the object and? Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting choice, um, and um, it's it's very handy uh, as well. It's it's very light, and it's and the thing is, it's not that as if the villagers don't know what exactly an umbrella is, because if you read the early parts of the story, everybody has an umbrella. The Binya's mother has an umbrella, but it's old and 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 worn out, so it's no longer used. And the schoolmaster's wife has an umbrella, and then if you remember, the husband says, "I'll you know dye it blue for you." So every Everybody has it. Uh, the only difference here with this blue umbrella is it's not very functional in the sense that um, it, it doesn't keep out the rain uh, okay. very effectively. It doesn't keep out the rain very effectively. You will still get drenched if it's a heavy rain. It's the aesthetic aspect. It's like a blue flower. You know, it resembles a flower. It resembles a natural aspect of beauty. You know, it's like a, a big blue flower on the brown hillside. So it, it is uh, a, an imitation of a natural object, like a very uh, pretty um, uh, flower, but it's not. So it, it comes close to being uh, organic material, but it isn't. It's a man-made stuff. So that close connection makes it very interesting for this um, set of people from the villages to admire it. It's like a rainbow. It's like a poppy, but it isn't. So we need to know the difference there. And if you read the final uh, sections of the story, there's one uh, line in in page 5123 in my edition. Um, Binya says, but an umbrella isn't everything, right? 
uh, and she left the old man holding the umbrella and went tripping down the road and there was nothing between her and the bright blue sky. So the umbrella was a stuff that had come between her and nature and her real nature, the human nature, and now that's taken off. Uh, she becomes more uh, in direct contact with the elements of nature. There's nothing man-made, nothing commodified to come between these two um, you know, you know, uh, features. And the bright blue sky. Again, bright blue sky, yeah. Because a blue umbrella mm -hmm. and yes. you know, blue sky. Yeah, and, so, and this okay. blue umbrella seems to have kind of become a block, a kind of a, a burden or a hurdle, right? So, And that has been taken away. This, The blue umbrella, this book has been classified as a children's book. The genre mm -hmm. given is, it's a children's book. So um, don't you think it's, we discussed this earlier too, but mm -hmm. don't you think it's as relevant for an adult mm -hmm. as it is for children? And since it's a children's book, what do you think is the moral of the story? <laughs> okay, uh, it's it's uh, classified as a children's book. Even Ruskin Bond says that it's my second children's book. And uh, um, the, the harsher aspects of life have been toned down, which is perhaps why Bond didn't want to delve deeper into the family, family life of uh, Binya, you know, how the mother suffers without a, a partner to run the family, or how Ram Barossa has become crabbed without a big family or a wonderful family to look after him or how Rajaram has become warped, distorted in the absence of a family. So that kind of background has been suppressed uh, so that children don't come into contact with all these difficult situations and circumstances. So it makes the book lighter. We just get to see uh, really black and white um, yes. kind of um, morality and moral figures. You know, and again, adults. it's not preachy either. It's not very preachy. It's not very preachy. And uh, even Binya has her failings uh, if, if we want to look closely at it, but we don't. And, and, and that's because we, the other elements of nature have been uh, highlighted. Um, and and uh, that's perhaps why. But then I want to bring this to the attention of the readers. Um, when there's a big fight going on uh, between Bidu and uh, Raja Ram, and it's a big fight, and the birds have been disturbed, the bulbuls and the magpies, you know, fly away in fear, and um, this fight is happening by uh, in by the side of the stream. Sometimes they are in the stream, they are out of it, and then Bidu uh, pins the boy down. And Binya doesn't separate them. Not one minute. She just goes there. She hurriedly goes after the umbrella, which is kind of floating away in the current. So even this little girl has her failings, but then uh, we, we tend not to uh, look closely. So if we look closely into the motivations, into the attitudes of the people here, we will know that um, this is... Um, this might be taken off from the genre of children's literature and put in the other section. So, but we don't, but we don't. And even if you look at um, Ram Barossa's language, the abusive language that he employs uh, to, talk, uh, to talk to Raja Ram, it's very disturbing, the word wretch. It, it keeps coming up uh, time and again. Uh, so it's very harsh language. But then um, we are led down a particular pathway down the hills that we don't notice all the pine needles and the leeches that are there strewn on this narrative. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll continue in the next session.